our next presenter, as the previous one, are from the UK, or is from the UK, and we are most grateful to the UK government for removing South Africa from the red list for travel. This only came into effect on Monday, which enabled our next speaker, Kate Robinson, to get on a plane on the same day and to arrive yesterday morning. Kate is no stranger to Stellenbosch. She's university librarian at the University of Bath in the UK. I'm sure you've heard this joke many times, but I couldn't resist. I would have liked to say, and here's to you, Mrs. Robinson, but then I realized wrong song, <laughs> wrong artist. For those of you who recall the 60s, as well as everyone familiar with the popular culture of the 60s, I'll sh I'm sure you will recognize the song. Our presentation is entitled Envisioning Academic Library Services, Services for the Nowhere Man or Woman During COVID-19. Over to you, Kate. So, good morning everybody and thank you for inviting me to speak today at this symposium. It, it feels particularly appropriate for me to be speaking here because on the 22nd of March 2020, I left South Africa to travel back to the UK overnight after visiting colleagues at Stellenbosch University. And this Monday, as Ilse has just said, I arrived back on one of the first flights out of the UK. Um, and it feels somehow like I've come full circle. Um, I was going to deliver this online, um, and I am rather chatty, so to make sure that I keep to my time, I'm going to stick to my notes, so I do apologise for that. Um, the day I arrived back in the UK was the day that the um, UK actually decided to lock down. Um, as Robert said, it took a little while. Um, and I arrived back on the day, just in time to hear Boris Johnson, the UK Prime Minister, announced our first lockdown. And in his speech at nine o'clock that evening, he said, to ensure compliance with the government's instructions to stay at home, we will immediately close all shops selling non-essential goods and other premises, including libraries. So within half an hour, our library building at the University of Bath, that had been open since 1996, all day, every day, 24 seven, nearly 24 years, had closed. And it was to remain that way for the next five months. So you might recognize this little chap on my first slide. It's a picture of Jeremy, the nowhere man, from the Beatles' 1968 film, Yellow Submarine. And to paraphrase Lennon and McCartney, suddenly we were sitting in a nowhere land, making all our nowhere plans for nobody. Well, nobody we could see at any rate. And it was a very strange situation, but one we have all faced and responded to over the last 18 months. We had a closed, unstaffed building and the challenge of providing remote services for remote students remote staff, remote researchers for two months left of the academic year. And that was including our exam time and some of which were finals. And no way of knowing how long the situation was going to last. So in this presentation, I'm going to touch on some of our virtual rather than our physical responses and give some time to consideration of our outcomes. Now, I fully expect you to recognize an awful lot of this in your own experiences and professional practices. I don't think I'm going to be telling you anything new, but I do think it's incredibly important that we don't simply move on, but that together we think through what's happened and how we responded in order to move forward effectively. In the UK, this immediate closure of the libraries was unexpected, but it was also unequivocal. We had to close the library. But of course, closing the building doesn't mean closing our services. Our users were scattered, accessing us from anywhere, wherever they happened to be, anywhere but, but in the library building. And this picture is a representation of our research collaborations. So it's very broad ranging, but for us the most important part is that we were suddenly only able to offer these virtual services and that our users were scattering. So what next? Well, my priorities are always our people. And as I saw it, our immediate challenge was threefold. Our colleagues, our library staff had left the previous day, expecting to return to work as usual in the building our academics who needed our help to shift to a purely digital offer, and our users, our students, have been making very good use of our building and our deadlines to meet for essays and projects and exams to take, and our researchers were still actively researching with their own deadlines and requirements. So this is a picture of me outside the library building looking in on a night when it was floodlit to mark the first anniversary of the first lockdown of the UK's National Day of Reflection. I thought it was rather poignant. 
and we had no idea of how long this would last. So let's take a closer look at these three groups, our colleagues, our academic colleagues, and our users. If we're to deliver our services, we need our library colleagues, and any shift to home working should have involved a good deal of infrastructure support, and actually a good deal of notice, not only for the tools to work with, IT equipment, etc., but suitable, appropriate space. This immediate shift, this half an hour shut, and we're not coming back in, did not allow for this. And for me, this has been one of the most important things throughout the last 18 months. We know how to provide a well-designed, safe workplace with tools for the job in a library setting. But to work, to then find itself inside people's homes, possibly surrounded by children and others as schools were also closed, was unprecedented and far from ideal. Colleagues made makeshift workstations with what they had, and they worked so hard to keep our existing services open and responsive as we worked together to navigate our new working environments. As time went on, we supported workplace assessments for home working, shipped out IT in chairs, varied our flexi time scheme to accommodate different pressures on people's time. Furlough and later flexible furlough came into play, and we adapted as government rules changed and tried to keep in touch as effectively as we could. New tools were rapidly introduced. Microsoft Teams and SharePoint began to overtake the use of email for our communications. And new groups were set up and new ideas shared. We even had a Christmas party online, which was ingenious and an awful lot of fun. If you can have fun but in, online, but you can. <laughs> I've been continually impressed by the ingenuity, the tolerance and the diligence of my colleagues in all that they've done and how they've continually adapted to everything that's been thrown at them. I won't dwell too long on this, as I think this could be a whole topic on its own, but I think it's an essential, essential to put our people up front and central. And for me, it demonstrates just how much the essence of the, uh, the, essence of the library is its people. So thinking about our academic colleagues, it can be argued that everything we do for our users also supports the work of our academic colleagues. But what I'm thinking of here are some very specific requirements and how we stepped in to support those. These, I think, were in two stages. So first off, we had to get through the exams. Not only did we have an immediate need to highlight all of our digital services as we shifted everything out of our building to make sure that our offer was clear to everyone, but at this time of the academic year, most of our teaching had ended. The focus was on revision and assessment. Access to our library building and our print collection ceased at the end of March, and so as new ways of examining were devised, drawing on techniques such as open book exams, we secured the material required for these, and we worked with the academics to deliver them at the point of need to students. A library reading list option was added to all taught courses, and we worked with academic colleagues on reading list creation and sourced electronic originals and copyright cleared section scans as alternative to recommended print resources. From this first period of lockdown onwards, we worked extremely hard to supplement our existing electronic collections to meet the needs of fully online teaching, including open book online exams. Negotiations with suppliers, publishers, and national consortia were key, as was the temporary relaxation of some elements of UK copyright legislation. We ensured we could make best use of the fast evolving national negotiations between high level stakeholders in relation to the e-textbook provision and negotiations with key platform suppliers resulted in the bulk of the core e-textbooks being temporarily released to the community in that electronic form, free of charge, and sometimes for the very first time in the UK. So we carried out extensive checking of recommended materials to ensure that these texts were available and discoverable for the revision and the exams. And we made sure that we knew what exam and project questions were coming up so that we didn't inadvertently end up actually answering the questions for some of our more ingenious students. Usage statistics from March to the end of the free access in July demonstrated the high demand for these resources. So as an illustration, 35 of our most heavily used ebook titles on one platform saw 10,389 individual user sessions, equating to 5,234 hours of reading, with 331,000 pages accessed. We were grateful to the amendments to the UK Copyright Agency license that allowed us to digitise more materials and for the support of the publishers, although a little wary of offering new resources that we wouldn't be able to continue to subscribe to, when the general, while their generosity did get us through an immediate problem, as time progressed and the exams ended, we were looking towards what seemed to be the continuation of difficulties of in-person education, and we began to plan for a very different academic year. And this was our phase two, our second stage. Now, the university had begun to develop the Bath Blend, and while this sounds like a rather nice coffee, its intention was to offer the full choice to our students for the coming year. They were to be able to choose whether they wanted to come in person or online, 
and they were to receive an equivalent quality experience. And this would also protect us against further lockdown so we could switch relatively seamlessly between the delivery methods. Well, it was a grand idea, but as one financial year ended, we began to see significant pressure on our budgets, both from a university approaching a new academic year with fiscal caution and from new financial models coming from publishers with the move to an e-textbook model. The latter seemed to be a shift in the way publishers made their revenue from core textbooks, moving from students buying print copies to an expectation from those students that the library would buy the e-version. We calculated that we would require £350,000, British pounds, to replace all the books that we knew had been well used by our students when we had the free access to them. So for us, that simply wasn't possible. And we looked to make best use of our own resources. And we were able to begin to return to the building in July. And while we didn't open our doors to our users immediately, we did have access to our own print collections. And so we were able to support our users through the provision of both our print and online resources. We have a specialist document scanner that delivers print, contact and print content in digital accessible formats. And this was incredibly useful in meeting the increased demands of staff and students. We saw a dramatic surge in demands from academics, as in preparation for the new semester, their scanning requests rose by a whopping 258% on the previous year. And as the academics continue to transform their curriculum planning, we also look to help by delivering all of our information skills teaching online and with the appropriate provision of reading list materials. We created tailored guidance and the support that the library can offer departments alongside best practice in creating reading lists. And through this, we reinforced and worked with academics on projects supporting the diversification of reading lists and recommended materials, while directly supporting the introduction of the Bath Blend with our library lists, which were adopted right across the university in our BLE. So a real team effort, great opportunity to demonstrate our value and our expertise, but pretty exhausting. So these are just some stats to illustrate the uptake of our inquiry services at this point. When I think about how our community make use of our library, my starting point is to think in terms of what I'd like. And, and no, I'm not pretending to be in my late teens again. But I am mean about how we keep things straightforward, how to be helpful, how not to have to explain how to use our services. That's something I could really dislike. Why can't our services be seamless? And instead, we should be designing them in a way that will be intuitive and fit with the technologies, for example, that our community is already using. So what would I look for in a service? I'd like to have an answer to my questions, but ideally I'd like not to have to ask. I'd like to be able to find things out easily for myself. And those of you who've heard me talk before might have heard me talking about the idea of a library family. People and services who are there for you, but they're not in your face. So we set about making sure that we were easy to use and easy to contact, and that our collections and our services were accessible as possible, and that our guidance was as comprehensive as it could be. So let's start with our teaching. Once the university had decided on the Bath Blend approach for teaching delivery for, the, for this academic year coming, 2021, our librarians prepared for remote delivery of all sessions. We've made use of our existing material, we attended relevant courses, and we exchanged knowledge with our colleagues to make best use of existing new technologies to reach our different user audiences. All library inductions for new services and researchers moved online, and we were able to contribute to departmental inductions as well, which also meant that for the first time in several years, we actually reached the first year undergraduates in the Department of Economics. Our economics subject librarian was delighted. Now, for most student groups, we also delivered inductions via online, live online, via Teams or Zoom. And working with academics, we decided on a case-by-case -case basis that the best approach for our varied information literacy teaching could be by creating a virtual course, teaching live online, or using a flipped classroom approach by providing material in advance, followed by live online Q&A sessions. Our doctoral skills sessions saw increased attendance and engagement in the online environment, and we received some really positive feedback. To comply with the latest digital accessibility regulations, we also spent considerable time enhancing video content with captions and with transcripts. And then our inquiries. So from the 23rd of March 2020, we'd moved everything online, with 2,630 inquiries resolved by the end of the semester, compared to well, one, about 1,000 for the same period during 2019. In total, we resolved about 8,000 online library inquiries for the initial COVID lockdown in March to the end of our summer vacation. And later, we introduced a new chat function to provide an extra route for our users to ask a question easily, to allow synchronous communication with library staff, where anyone can open a chat with library staff during our standard working hours. 
and by updating and extending all of our teaching and induction materials on our web page, subject resource and access guidance, we ensured comprehensive library support continued to be available for all our users in fully electronic form. And we saw a significant rise in the library homepage, which is the most used page in the whole university website, apart from the Find Somebody page. Thinking about our other service adaptations, so our document delivery service sourced online equivalents of items requested in print by our students without passing on any costs to them. We ran click and collect and scan and send services whilst access to our print collections was restricted. And then we flipped 24 seven reservation service for materials on loans, however. And we were open 24 seven, actually the physical library building from the July. I should mention our collections again. Our digital collections are comprehensive and very mature. We've had a digital first policy for many years and we're aided in this by our subject mix of predominantly science and technology subjects with a sprinkling of social sciences and only one visual discipline in architecture. Nevertheless, we've still seen an accelerated digital shift this year and it's been amplified with our ebook acquisition and we've also seen overall use of our e-journals collection continuing its long-term upward trend with over three and a half million downloads. With the reopening of study spaces came strict social distancing measures and so new spaces across campus and the city were made available in which to study. And while these are physical rather than virtual services and not in the scope of this talk, we did make best use of technology to ensure the spaces were discoverable. And to do this, we promoted the availability of study space and in the city and supported it by a study space booking system to stitch the spaces together and to guarantee a space for users through a reservation system. We also developed new processes to support the smooth joining and arrivals experience for students under COVID-19 restrictions with library cards produced and posted to approximately 2000 students prior to their arrival. So every year we run a visual while we were away campaign for our students returning from placement and the start of 2021 this year seemed to be even more important to highlight the services and service developments available to them. So we had rather a lot to say and the changes came to thick and fast and so did our communications. A few years ago we recruited to a new post of an impact and engagement librarian and they really helped us. They worked alongside our own library engagement group in close contact with our colleagues outside the library in the university communications and with the students union. We talked to our users through our blog, our web pages, Twitter, Instagram and in person, well in virtual person, through teams, staff student liaison meetings, inquiries and teaching. And we talked about our services during lockdown, our plans for social distancing, our new adapted services, our regulations and protocols, and then we repeated and amplified these messages so that they were well understood while responding and adapting to the feedback we received through these communications as a springboard for engagement. We were also very aware of the impact of this uncertainty and disruption was having on our student body, especially our first years and our final years. And we ran a number of campaigns and initiatives that were intended to reach out to our community, reflecting the work of the university in wellbeing and inclusion, and also highlighting some of our own initiatives designed to ease the pressure and to support students in their leisure time, as well as in their academic endeavours. We enhanced our Read Well collection of wellbeing books in partnership with the student services and widening participation. And our work with the Students' Union and Equality, Diversity and Inclusion continued to develop our Black History Literature and Culture Reading List, supporting Black History Month and the Black Lives Matter movement and our LGBTQ literature collection. Subject librarians got involved with student and department movements around decolonising the curriculum and subsequently created a library list of decolonising curricula and higher education, which was then embedded in the university's virtual teaching and learning hub. During Storytelling Week, we launched a lib guide around reading for pleasure, which brought together popular non-fiction and we supported student living ambassadors uh, in a book club. We had city guides, we had an international book list, popular fictions, library and chill, which were binge reads inspired by popular streaming shows and a blog highlighting the TV radio off air recordings via our subscription to box of broadcasts. Some projects were on a smaller scale, such as ones where we were asked by a member of academic staff to support a project to create a book group for postgraduate research students using a small grant from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And we identified and obtained e-books covering issues relating to bias, race, gender, all of which became part of the library's collections. We were really excited to launch our research data management adventure game that our team had developed with Stellenbosch. And after all, who doesn't need an adventure when designing a data management plan? Library staff shared pictures on Instagram of their well-being activities as part of Be Well Week with snaps of us practicing wellness via art, walks, that kind of thing. 
and we recorded our congratulations and added these to the university's graduating subject students celebration video and our subject librarians participated in open days and virtual information fairs. And here we are back amongst the collections with our users returning in person. And the questions I have in mind are, what will we keep? What will we change? How will we know if we've got this right? And how will we work? So let's think about our three groups again, this time starting with our users. This year, students and researchers are expected to return to campus, and our Vice-Chancellor wishes us to deliver face-to-face -face service wherever possible. However, with restrictions on travel, COVID still in circulation, and the population and protocols around isolating if in close contact, not everyone can be on campus, and the need for virtual services remain. We see this as a year of review. We want to take the best bits from last year, roll them out again, and see how they sit with our user community now we're coming back together. Deciding what to keep has been relatively easy. We can see what seems to be working well, both from the uptake from our users, but also from what works better for us. And so, with these in mind, we're looking to retain much of what we've developed. Some of examples of these are our library teaching and induction materials and our web page subject resource and access guidance. These remain in high demand and the library's web pages remain the most popular, mostly, <laughs> apart from the, that, that search guide, uh, the most popular in the whole university website. We've created a new triage service behind the scenes to manage the increased flow of online inquiries. And our new chat function has provided ostensibly seamless and extremely responsible, responsive service for our users' inquiries. We continue to produce and post our new library cards in advance. And these are actually the de facto university ID cards and they provide access to buildings and credit and cafes and food outlets, etc. So they're absolutely essential. But the efficiency and the preparedness has supported a really smooth process for returning students this year. We are continuing our free scan and send service for students to support their remote access to our materials. And we continue to deliver our reservations and self-service and haven't reinstated our short loan collection. So only our special collections and archives require, require any mediated access for our users. We continue with our study space booking system to stitch those spaces together and to guarantee a choice of space for users. And this has been extended to working in collaboration with our timetabling people to make best use of teaching rooms when they're not required for teaching so that we can ensure we have lots of group workspaces available as our students come back together again. We were anxious not to forget our alumni and after not being able to admit them to our building for a year due to lack of study space, we now offer them all free membership in perpetuity and remote access to more of our e-resources and access to our library building. We continue, as always, to place great emphasis on promoting our services and engaging our users, because after all, what's the point of offering a service if you don't tell people about them? And we're now working on the assumption that we should treat all second year students as if they were first years with regard to their inductions and general settling into the university life. Now, I also have concerns about a cohort of students who are joining us who've had an incredibly disruptive education over the last few years. And we're thinking hard about how best to support their return to study how we can identify gaps in their skills, and how we can best support their ongoing development. What we know so far about our approach from our national surveys is that we've done extremely well. In the National Student Survey, we came joint first in the country for student satisfaction with our library services. And as a library, we were also above the sector average and ahead of the Russell Group in the postgraduate taught, postgraduate research, and postgraduate doctoral experience surveys. So I've been very pleased about that. But this has been such a strange time, we can't be complacent. We work very closely with our students' union as well as with our academic departments, and this will be particularly important this year as we evaluate service use. Not only through surveys and data, but also through direct interaction, feedback and observation. We're also prepared to move back to virtual services should the need arise. So what about our academics? What do they need? I have just a few points I'd like to make here. They're going to be returning to face-to-face -face teaching, but some of the large lectures where the teaching is more didactic will remain online, so they can concentrate on making the best use of the actual contact time with smaller groups. This contact time will be enhanced by directed readings, and we will support this through our collections. We know that they will be emphasising group work as we rebuild our community, and our spaces are already responding to this. And with new ways of assessing attainment, not just through exams, and most of these are going to remain as open books rather than returning to large examination hall arrangements, our resources are even more essential for our students. So working in partnership with academics and through library consortium negotiations to achieve best value, making best use of tight budgets to deliver what's needed remains a priority. 
And what about us? Well, we've proved ourselves to be agile, responsive, and innovative. We've devised and implemented new ways of working, and we now need to decide what to keep and what to change. But what I don't think we're going to do is to go backwards to where we were before the pandemic. I was listening to Luis Suarez, now the knowledge manager, not the footballer, um, speaking at the latest SILIP presidential debate in September, where he spoke about work as no longer being a physical space, but a state of mind. And I'm not sure that we really do have the freedom to choose where and when to work yet, but perhaps we should begin to expect the unexpected and to start to prepare now for what we want to happen next. So how are we going to do that? Over the past year, SILIP, our professional body in the UK and the UK's Library um, and Information Association, has been ups updating its professional knowledge and skills base. Now, this serves as a very effective sector skills standard. And our university has also been crafting its five-year strategy. So using a World Cafe format, we've been considering our response and contribution to the strategy, but also working with SILIP, we are launching a questionnaire to explore the skills that we wish to develop to support us in this. This is our university archivist and a colleague receiving some visitors during the modern pentathlon European Championships, which were hosted by our university in the summer 2020. It's just an example of working with others, but why do we do it? We do it because it's a good idea and our mutual interest. We don't really have to do it, but we do it because it's beneficial for us and for our users. And I wonder in some regards if we work better together virtually. Does it make better use of our time in our committees, for example, more welcoming to attendees and a new participant when there's no room booking or coffee ordering to be taken into account? We've been invited to more places. We've contributed to more meetings than ever before, and it's been a pleasure to work with academics and other professional services to respond to the challenges of the pandemic, with all of us being part of the change itself, making things happen. My personal favourite has been a resilient curriculum project team led by our Pro Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning, where we were truly agile and responsive and doing things together. All the way through, I think we benefited immensely from working with others, and despite responding to a very dire situation, we also worked together to innovate. And I'll give you just two examples of this at the university. We supported alternative placement arrangements in architecture for those not able to get placements. And instead, they completed various sets of coursework and used courses and videos to enhance and certify their skills. And also as a university during our first lockdown, we began to wonder about recruitment and progression. Would we be able to welcome students from overseas? And what would the world of work look like for our own graduating students? So we worked with our academic skills centre and our careers service, and we designed an undergraduate to postgraduate programme for the university. And we designed that to support our recent graduates to prepare for postgraduate study and to consider their future career options. And within this, we produced tutorials on things like advanced literature searching skills. But we captured our own students and kept them for another year, and we got them onto those postgraduate um, courses, and we supported them in that. I should also mention our own community of librarians. I can't think of any other profession that comes together so well to help each other. I've been so very grateful for the support and for the ideas sharing and the collaborative thinking and, do, and the collaborative doing that's got through all of this. And so while we've been sitting in a nowhere land, it's really felt as if we've been with somebody. And now the students have come back and we're coming together, at least for now. And I, for one, am really pleased about that. And I'm looking forward to seeing how the changes that we've made will be received as we continue to do the very best we can for our community, whilst remaining ready to change our approach as and when we need to. So I hope what I've described to you resonates with you, and I thank you for your attention.